I want to do a problem where we're going to look at the electric field of an infinite plane of charge. And the way we're going to do it is to use our result from finding the electric field of an infinite line of charge. But we'll have to do some modifications to the expression that we got there. Now, my expressions differ a little bit from the ones in the OpenStax textbook. They use different directions on things, but I'll try to modify uh, their version to my version. And what they have for the electric field of an infinite line of charge is uh, an expression that looks like E is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which I just wrote as K sub E. and then 2 lambda divided by z. And that's in the k hat direction. What we're going to do is think of the infinite plane of charge as being made up of a whole bunch of infinite lines of charge. And I'm going to just draw one such line. You have to imagine that this thing goes out forever in each direction. And I'm going to confine myself at first to a short length of that that'll have a length L because I want to somehow uh, use this expression but turn it into something where I'm getting the uh, field of a very narrow line or a very narrow tiny rectangle of this thing that has a width dx then it's going to stretch out to infinity in either direction. However, how much charge is this going to have? Well, it's going to have a little area dA. And so, and when we're talking about planes, we talk about a surface charge density. And we use sigma for the surface charge density. But the amount of charge that we'll have in a little area dA will be dq, it's going to equal sigma times dA, but dA in this case is going to be, whoops, LDX, excuse me, LDX there. Well, dQ over L will be the amount of charge per unit length in my little tiny narrow, very narrow line of width dx, and that's equivalent to the lambda that we had, but it will equal sigma dx. And so for an infinite line that is part of a, an infinite plane of charge with a surface charge density sigma, I can write the electric field of just that part of it. And I'm going to leave the arrows off because we're going to be dealing with angles here very soon. And uh, however, it will be uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times, instead of lambda, it'll be sigma dx. So 2 sigma dx. And I'm going to use the letter R because it'll be the distance that we are away from it. Although I'm still going to use their, uh, their x hat direction. So now I'm going to draw my infinite plane of charge here, going out in either direction. I'm going to have this be the positive direction, this be the negative direction, and this is going to be my origin on the x coordinate part. And I'll consider a little narrow line out here of width dx. And so that'll be that thing. And I want to know the electric field up here at a point P, which is going to be a distance z above the plane, which is actually going to be the xy plane. Uh, you have to imagine that we're looking end on for a line that goes to infinity in both directions into the board and back out of the board. And 
the distance that will be away from that line will be this length that I just drew and this will be DE pointing away that way. Now this distance, if this is the dimension X right here, it'll be the square root of X squared plus Z squared. And Z is going to be a constant. That's just how far we are above the plane. And we're going to consider every bit of charge to the left and every bit of charge to the right. That means an infinite number of infinite lines to the left and an infinite number of lines to the right. Now, from symmetry, I've got a mirror image each side of this thing, and any component that points to the left or the right is going to get canceled out, because I could always, I'll find a little bit of electric field that points in this direction due to something a distance x to the left. If I go the same distance to the right, I'll find the same amount of electric field, and the left and right components will cancel out, but the Z component or the vertical component will not, and that's in the Z direction. So it's the one in the Z direction that I want to know, and this will be DE sub Z pointing up that way. Let's see, well this angle theta will equal this angle theta, and let's see, theta is going to be the Oh, well, it's the cosine of theta, I think, that I'm... No, the sine of theta that I'm going to want. Uh, DE sub Z in magnitude will equal DE sine of theta. Okay, this divided by the DE will equal the sine of theta. So it'll be DE sine theta, and sine theta will just be Z over the square root of X squared plus Z squared. So DE sub Z, the Z component of this electric field, will equal DE times Z divided by the square root of X squared plus Z squared. So I have that so far. Now I'm going to have to do some work. Um, to get a DE out of this, actually this is a DE here. I just have to recognize that R in this case is going to equal this distance here. So we'll get a, quite a long expression here for DE sub Z. but a fair amount of it's going to be constants. So DE was 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught and times 2 sigma DX divided by R, which is going to be the distance from where the line is to the field point that we're calculating here. So that'll just be x squared plus z squared. I didn't square that z there. And then I have to multiply by the sine of theta, which is going to be z divided by another x squared plus z squared. Okay, well, let's see. Z is a constant, and so I can pull it outside of the integral or separate that out. And when I do that, I will have a 2, a sigma, and a Z. And then on the bottom, I'll have 4 pi epsilon naught. So there's my parts that actually change. And then I'll have uh, dx divided by, well, a square root times a square root is not a square root, so I'll just have x squared plus z squared on the bottom. To calculate the entire contribution, e sub z, which is going to be the only remaining part of the electric field, because any left and rightness to it is going to vanish in the integral or be canceled out, it will equal, I have to integrate from minus infinity 
2 plus infinity. Oh, I forgot to pull my constants outside, but I will in a second. 2 sigma z over 4 pi epsilon naught. And I'm hanging off to take the 2 over the 4. We'll see if we get any numbers out of this when we do it. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, and then dx over x squared plus z squared. Okay, and that's an integral I can look up. I'll still have the constant terms out front. 2 sigma z divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. And then when I integrate dx over x squared plus z squared, it happens to be this particular integral here. And I have to do a little bit of thinking to actually evaluate this here when I've got infinities on this, but I'll be able to figure it out. Um, instead of z's, they've got an a here, so I want to replace the a's with z's. And I will have uh, 1 over z times arctan. I'll just write that as inverse tangent of x over z. And I'm evaluating it at minus infinity to infinity. And I need to draw myself a little picture to figure out just what's going to happen on this thing. And uh, here's what I get. Um, I'm going way out here. This will just be the x-axis and this will be the z-axis. But I'm going way out on the, the x-axis. However, the arctan of x over z. Okay. Well, here's x and here is z and the angle that we're calculating here, the angle for which the tangent is x over z is what I get as you go way out here. Well, what you get when you go way out here is this angle gets closer and closer to pi over 2. And in the limit, as x goes toward infinity, it does become pi over 2. Similarly, when you're at minus infinity, it goes toward minus pi over 2. And so what we have here is this e sub z will equal, uh, let's see, well, I'll keep everything for the time being, but 2 sigma z over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over z. And you can see those z's are going to divide out, but I'll have pi over 2 minus a negative pi over 2 when I evaluate this thing, which ends up being pi over 2 plus pi over 2, which is just pi. And I'll get, simplifying this, well, let's see. Well, I'll leave it a mess for a second and then show you how everything divides out. 2 sigma z over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over z times pi. Okay, well, that z divides with that z. This pi divides with that pi. And I get sigma over 2 epsilon naught for the result. Whoops. Sigma over 2 epsilon naught. And that's the field of my infinite plane of charge. Now in the textbook, they do this in a different way. They actually look at first a ring of charge and then they do a, an integral similar to this to get the electric field of a disk of charge. And then they imagine if you get very close to that disk or if the radius of the disk takes off toward infinity, what does it change to? And they get the same expression. So there are are different ways to come at this, but this we added together a whole bunch of lines, an infinite number of lines, to get the electric field above it. And so now if you imagine this infinite plane of charge and anywhere on it, you're a distance z above it, the electric field there 
is going to point in this direction and it's going to be sigma over 2 epsilon naught in the k hat direction. And it doesn't diminish with distance if you have a truly infinite plane of charge. Now where this expression is actually useful is if you get close to a flat sheet of charge so that the distance you are away from it is very small compared to the sideways dimensions of the thing. Then this expression will work just fine. And so that works. By the way, the other expressions that they develop in section, I think it's 5.2 in your textbook of the online OpenStax book, they do a ring of charge. So there's my x-axis. Here's a ring of charge that has a linear charge distribution that's constant on it. And the electric field here is going to equal 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the total charge on the ring divided by x squared plus r squared to the three halves and we also have the distance x on here and that's in the i hat direction. Now if you look at the limit of this expression here as x gets much larger than r uh, you can do something like pull the x squared out of here and imagine x going toward infinity you end up with the electric field of a point charge. You'll have 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q total over x squared is what you end up with. And you could try that limit out if you want to. But that's for a ring of charge. If you make this into a solid disk instead that has a surface charge density sigma, And I'm just going to write that as a disk with sigma. Sigma will be the surface charge density. You get a more complicated expression, but uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times 2 pi sigma minus 2 pi sigma x over the square root of r squared plus x squared and that's in the i hat direction again. So here we have a, a disk of charge and they look at the limit as r goes toward infinity in, uh, in the textbook and what happens in that case is that this term vanishes because with that r squared on the bottom, if it goes toward infinity and x is finite, this whole term vanishes. You get 2 pi sigma over 4 pi epsilon naught. Uh, the pi's divide out. 2 over 4 is 1 over 2 and you end up with sigma over 2 epsilon naught, which is what we just got for an infinite plane of charge and which is what you have in this case. So they went at the infinite plane in a from a different direction but get the same result and you should. So there we have some charge distributions. Now we kind of know what it is for an infinite plane of charge. We know what it is for an infinite line of charge. We know what it is for point charges. We know what it is for a ring of charge and a disk. So that covers the simple geometries. If you have a spherical charge distribution, it acts like a point charge. So we more or less know what the electric fields are for simple charge distributions.